good afternoon, um, everybody, or whatever time zone you're in. Uh, I'm Chris Anderson. Um, by, by day, I'm CEO of 3DR, drone software company. But um, uh, what I'm here to talk about is uh, racing uh, autonomous cars and AI-driven cars in particular. Um, about 10 years ago, um, when, I, I, when I was the editor of, of Wired magazine, um, I got interested in uh, the notion of aerial robotics as a opportunity to you know, rethink um, you know, the notion of aerospace with smartphone-like mentality. Um, realized, as many people did, that sort of hardware was changing back in those days, Arduino, 3D printing, all that sort of thing. The iPhone came out in 2007. And I saw that as an opportunity to, you know, to, to really explore what, what that kind of technology could do in an, in an aerospace context. And um, it was a hobby, not a, not a job. So I started a community called DIY Drones. That community then created a number of big open source projects um, and, and really helped, helped uh, start an, an industry. And today, your modern drones like DJIs, et cetera, all kind of come from that, that heritage. Um, now with drones, we've largely solved all the big problems about, you know, control theory and, and you know, the flight and the vehicles and the electronics itself. Um, and for 10 years on, I was, you know, looking for another technical challenge and realized that self-driving cars represented in many ways a harder problem. Um, although it seems simpler because it's a 2D problem, not a 3D problem, you don't, you, you can't count on GPS to guide you. You need to use computer vision, AI, and things like that. And, um, it's a very hot topic. There's lots of companies out there, but um, you know, in the same way that I didn't have a, you know, a, a Predator or a Global Hawk drone back in those in 2007, so I made my own. I didn't have a self-driving car, um, you know, today, and it's not a full-size one. And so the question was, you know, had the time come to repeat this model of the DIY, you know, sort of applying the letters DIY to a really interesting technical um, and industrial, um, you know, domain? And, and see what happens when you let regular people, you know, innovate um, at low cost and, and open source. So the presentation I'm going to give you, and then I'll show you some, um, some, uh, some props afterwards, is really about uh, that, that history. Uh, so let me present my screen. So um, one of the, uh, one of the uh, you know, lines you hear a lot in, in the tech industry is that the next big thing will start out looking like a toy. And you know, this is true here as well. When we first came out with small DIY drones, people said, oh, those are just toys, the RC airplanes, the RC helicopters, you know, that's not real. Uh, today, 99.99% .99 of the drones in the air today came out of this, this quote unquote, you know, toy approach. In other words, it looked more, it kind of bottoms up. It started simple, cheap, open, and then got more sophisticated. So in a sense, we put propellers on a smartphone rather than taking a pilot out of a, out of a 747. Um, so that approach um, of, of, of you know, starting in something that looked then easily be dismissed as a toy turns out to have a lot of heritage in, um, in producing real innovation that becomes enterprise worthy. So it, you know, we started really um, in, in warehouses with uh, tape you know, on, on paint on, on, the, on, the, on the ground. And um, everybody brought just whatever they had. And, you know, the objective was to obviously get around the track, um, to get around the track faster than somebody else. Um, and then as things went on, we started to create more standard platforms and we started to have more standard um, races. Um, so the, the platform that is perhaps best known today is called a donkey car. And, um, you know, these are the, uh, the founders. Donkey Car is a, um, it's a, as you can see, it's a small chassis. It's gotten even smaller than that. Um, it, it uses Raspberry Pi. Um, it uses a form of deep learning called reinforcement. Uh, sorry, excuse me. I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, a, a form of deep learning called behavioral cloning. So what you do is you just, you just load the software onto your Raspberry Pi, uh, the vehicles, there you follow instructions, it's not hard to put together. And then you drive it around the track manually a few times. It then learns from, you know, from that, it correlates what the camera sees with the input you gave it. And then you upload the, you know, the, the, that model to AWS where the deep learning framework um, you know, trains on it creates what's called an inference layer, a model that you could then download, and then that model is fast enough to run on a Raspberry Pi, even a Raspberry Pi 3. So that's, that's the way that works. Um, you know, the, today's uh, versions look like that. You can see the components are really simple. It's just a, a 3D printed shell, 
a Raspberry Pi and a standard Raspberry Pi camera on a regular RC car. It doesn't really matter what kind. And, uh, and there's, there's the small board you can buy on Amazon that, that, that connects it to. And that's just simply it. Most of the hard training work is done in the cloud. Um, but the inference is all done, you know, on board. And, you know, this, this car is capable of fully navigating, you know, a, a, a track and avoiding cones and things like that. Um, you, you know, it, what's enabled it is things like TensorFlow um, and, you know, the, the availability of both AWS for cloud compute and really good open source tools for, for, for deep learning. Um, Python, of course, you know, is, is, the, is, is the basics of it. And, and again, we use Raspberry Pi. The objective here is to do it really, really cheaply. Um, you know, no car should cost more than about $300, um, ideally less. Um, you know, yes, you could put more expensive computers on. Yes, you could use faster cars, et cetera. But that's not the point. The point is that it's really a software challenge. And this is to give people, you know, real world experience in using AI. Many of you have tried, um, you know, many of you do, of course, AI already. But uh, those of you who tried to do kind of robotics challenges with AI probably just started in simulators online. Simulators are absolutely fantastic, but the problem with simulators is that the data is perfect. You know, the, you know, the, the, whatever, whatever inputs you're getting is are essentially synthetic, and so they can be absolutely perfect. The cameras are, you know, can see things perfectly. The lighting is perfect. If you have GPS, that's perfect, et cetera. And of course, when you get in the real world, it's, it's, it's anything but. Um, lighting is terrible. Just, there's there's, there's, there's uh, spectators around the, 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 uh, the track at some times and not at other times. And it's a real, it's a real mess. Um, so the, you know, the virtue here is to be able to kind of test AI in the real world against noisy data, very unpredictable scenarios. And that's where we get real, real learning. Um, the, you know, we also take it, this is about as big as we get. This is uh, taking it outside to a, a real racing track. This is an electric go-kart um, that is, uh, was created by uh, Carl Bass, the former CEO of, of Autodesk. And this is kind of a funny uh, a picture is that, um, you know, here, he, here he is, the CEO of a, of a big publicly traded company. Um, and what we've done is we've taken that steering wheel and we basically made it so he can't turn it. It's being driven by this big uh, servo, this big red servo. And all we've given him is a red kill button. So, you know, God knows how much this guy is worth. But um, we basically put him in this car without a helmet. That was his choice, not ours. <laughs> and, um, and all we said is, look, it's going to drive itself. And all you can do is hit the button and, and, and stop it. Now, the good news is that he didn't have to do it. Um, the bad news is that we didn't make it around the track, you know, entirely. But, but that's kind of a, you know, a, to give an example of even tougher real world conditions, you know, out there in, in um, you know, in, 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 in the lighting, uh, the outdoor lighting where the, the sun and reflections can be all over the place. Um, in you know, AWS, um, uh, Amazon and a number of other companies have now adopted this um, as a way to teach uh, AI. So um, Amazon has something called DeepRacer. And at their AWS um, conference, you can, you can see these uh, going. Um, very similar um, uh, approach. Um, they're using it to teach reinforcement learning. Um, and uh, here, I'm going to show you a little bit more. Actually, I'm gonna, before I get into it, I'm going to pause for a second. Um, uh, Amazon's not the only one. Amazon is using um, uh, self-driving cars or subscale cars to teach reinforcement learning. Google has a, a program that does it as well. Uh, Nvidia has their Jetson, um, their Jetbot and Jet Racer programs to teach deep learning on the Jetson platform. Um, Arm has done this. Uh, Mapbox has done this, and you're starting to see this become quite popular with big tech companies as a as a fun, engaging way to get conference participants or anybody really to participate with deep learning, you know, and learn it in a way that feels more more tangible, more more has more real world practicality than just doing it online in the in the simulator. Um, this is a uh, this is a it's a little chaotic um, the races this is our um, all cars race which is our demolition dirty derby where all the cars go at the same time and as you can see it's 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 pretty uh, it's pretty chaotic you, I think that kid in the back has been hit three times um, but so we have we have good fun I, I assure you that not all the races uh, look like this um, normally they start with just uh, two cars and um, the cars race head to head. Um, you know, we have ladders and we match them against people at similar speed, but we do, we do try to have fun. This is the, uh, the car eye view, and um, hopefully you'll see this. This is a, a car that is not using deep learning, but rather typical computer vision. Um, what you can see is it's, it's, it's um, looking at the cones and sees the cones and then creates a localization 
uh, map based on where the cones are. And the top right, you can see that uh, the car knows where it is on the track based on its on where the cones are. Um, that, uh, that 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 cloud of dots is a particle filter, so there's a probability of it being there based on on what it's seen before. Um, and uh, they also have versions of this that actually look up at the ceiling um, and uh, you look at a pattern of lights and localize itself in that. So these are all really creative efforts. Now this is again all done on the car itself using very cheap and Raspberry Pi. It's really nothing more complex than that. It's really quite a sophisticated uh, process, and we are going very very fast. Now this one. This one was probably going about you know 20 miles an hour, but you'll see we're going even faster than that now. So you might you might say, well, God, you know, how how realistic is this? How relevant is this to what's really going on with self-driving cars? And the answer is that it's it's look, you know, these things cost $300, and the self-driving car costs a million dollars. So you know, so we're we're probably you know um, you, you can't expect them to be identical, but there are some parallels. Um, typically, we'll use one or two cameras, um, you know, either either monocular or stereo vision. Uh, you know, Google or Waymo one might use five. We'll use Raspberry Pi. They'll use tons of, you know, NVIDIA, you know, um, boards, TX, TX2, Xavier, and above. Um, they'll sometimes have one radar unit uh, for obstacle detection. They'll have five. Um, our LiDAR units, um, I'll show you one in a moment, are, are T, uh, 2D. Maybe they're all faster than 4,000 points per second, maybe they're 10,000 points per second. But again, the big guys are doing 3D LiDAR at 3 million points a second. The difference is, of course, our 2D LiDARs which you know, which just uh, rotate in the plane, cost um, sixty-nine dollars, and theirs probably costs you know seventy thousand or my, I guess the Google ones you can't even buy, um, but they're seventy thousand dollars and up. So you can see that there's, you know, there, there, there's there's um, there's parallels between what we do and what the big guys do, and so we're ending up using very similar techniques, but by keeping the cost down really low, we we make them accessible to everybody else. We have outdoor races that use GPS. We have wheel encoders. Um, of course, we have IMUs, you know, for initial sensing. We use most of the same software stacks as the big guys, although not nearly as, as sophisticated. Same simulator, Unity-based, um, and you know, again, the, the the difference is, you know, a factor of a thousand um, in, in in or more in price. And that's very much what we tried to do with drones, uh, you know, 10 years ago. Is is try to do something that was 80% as good and one one thousandth one one thousandth it's expensive um, and that's a very powerful model because it allows regular people to participate um, this is just an example um, we you know now in a time of a pandemic of course we we have to use a lot of simulators as well and so of course we have all this uh, we have simulators various courses this is a simulator of a course that the spark fund used to run called the autonomous vehicle competition um, and we've simulated most of the courses that you'll have out there this is this is a good thing to be doing that before the race. It's a good thing to be doing when you don't have access to the race itself. But it, it nothing compares to the to, to the real thing. Um, let me go back here. Um, so um, I'm bringing that back up again. Um, the um, yeah, the the cars come in uh, basically four different uh, types. Um, there's some that are based on a on, on simple computer vision, and uh, we tend to prefer. Although you can use Raspberry Pis or anything like that. We we um, we have a lot of people who use the OpenMV um, camera, which is a $69 camera and processor, all kind of combined into one little board um, that really does all of it for you. Fantas uses my MicroPython as an environment. Fantastic ID. You know, super. If you haven't played with computer vision, it is it is super super fun. Um, and we're able to have a full car, the one on the bottom left, for for $90 that we use uh, with kids um, to teach them about uh, computer vision. And that's what we call it, the minimum viable racer. And uh, there'll be a link to that uh, later on in the, in the presentation. But that's kind of how we get people started. And OpenMV is a, is a very powerful platform and can be used to go even faster. Um, but, uh, but, but right now we're keeping it as the, the, the kind of low, low barrier to entry version. Then there's a lot of custom computer vision or LiDAR ones. They're using custom code to really localize. And you saw one of them that was looking at cones. It's called Cone Slam. A slam stands for simultaneous location and mapping. And you can, you can map off cones, you can map off lights, you can map off, map off other, other features. Um, those things, you can either use Raspberry Pis or the NVIDIA Jet Nano, which costs $99, a really, really you know, good, uh, um, you know, uh, let's say computer vision uh, board. Then we get into the deep learning side, and that really comes into two kinds. It's the behavioral cloning, which I told you about before, where you manually drive a few times, it learns the correlation between images and, and inputs, and then, and then trains a the network, or reinforcement learning, where you give it certain objectives. You say, you look, you know, your objective is to stay on the stay on the course. 
um, and you get you know reward functions if you do it. You get punished if you if you don't. And um, you know Amazon's uh, DeepRacer and Nvidia's JetBots uh, use use similar approaches. Uh, Amazon's DeepRacer has to be trained in a simulator because um, that's where reinforcement learning, learning works best. Nvidia's uh, JetBot is one where you basically show it. You, you just drive around the track, and, and every image um, as you pull it up when, during the training period, you just click on where it should where it should drive. Um, and so it learns it, it learns that way by you sort of supervising their um, their approach, and that's called supervised uh, learning. And so that's a, that's kind of a little bit related to behavioral cloning, but once again, you're training it. You have a training period and then a racing period. Um, the car on the bottom right, by the way, is Amazon's uh, Deep Racer, which you can buy um, right now on on Amazon. Um, and, but you don't need to buy any of these. Um, all these things you'll see soon are uh, in the next few slides are available uh, for free as in, in a simulated version. So you can just run you can run the you know, basically your your computer feel you know pretends to be a car. The simulator pretends to be the real world. The simulator is remote or it's local, and you can uh, do it basically all from your desktop to to see how it goes. Um, these are these are our results, and as you can see, we've been doing this about uh, you know two or three years, and we started off not very good. Um, the yellow line here represents the fastest human time, and um, we did we have found some. We, you can see that at the end it gets a it gets a slightly faster. Um, you know, we're aware that we may not know humans who can drive very, you know as fast as the fastest humans out there. So let's just call it the fastest human time of any human we know. And um, the deep learning approaches and computer vision approaches have, have been pretty much marching, you know, together, um, uh, you know, for most of this time, getting better as they as we get better at techniques. More recently, um, the deep learning has found some limits in its ability to to go fast and to train and to handle the complex environments that we throw at it with different, you know, different number of cars on the track. We have a uh, we we have a random cone. That we place somewhere in the track, so the cones on the outside of the track, you have to be on the inside of them. But there will be one random cone on the on the you know within the track itself that you must miss or pay a penalty. And we have a, a child always, some some kid at the event is always designated to be the random cone uh, placer, placer, and they just move it around. And the deep learning, you know, uh, sometimes struggles with that. The computer vision again, as it starts to localize off, you know, when use lidar and and and, and cameras with things like fisheye lenses that look at the whole ceiling. Are getting really, really good. They're highly optimized for the track, and so far, the right now, the the, uh, the computer visions are way faster than any human we know. Probably faster than any human anywhere, but we don't. We haven't tried against everybody, but they're certainly faster than any human we know. Uh, deep learning is not yet faster um, than any human, but you know, uh, there's a series of new techniques and um, all the simulator training. I think is going to allow people to uh, to uh, to turn that blue curve back down again. Um, it, uh, it's getting quite popular. We started in, in um, you know, in, in random warehouses. We now work in a place called Circuit Launch, which is like a hackerspace um, near Air Oakland Airport in the Bay Area. There's, um, there's about uh, probably on the order of 50 of these groups of these DIY robocars groups around um, the world, um, and they have local um, meets. Um, so this is just the ones in the in, in Oakland, which is the you know, sort of east east side of the Bay Area. Um, and we typically have about 400 people showing up for each event, um, something on the order of you know 40 to 60 um, competitors. Um, it, circuit Launch is just the best place. They have the um, they have really consistent lighting. They have a carpeted floor. Uh, the tracks there are there all 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 the time. I mean, the meetings are every once a quarter, but the tracks there all the time, so people can go to to uh, to to practice in between. And that's that's really um, you know. Plus, they serve this amazing Brazilian barbecue um, for free. Every time we do this, and um, and we always have guest speakers from Nvidia or Amazon or or, or Google um, to uh, you know to 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 tell us what's what's cool and coming up. Um, so those those events have been have been very successful. Um, so you know you may ask, well, you know why is this happening now? Um, so back so when we did drones ten years ago, the enabling technologies were essentially smartphone technologies. Um, you know sensors that were in chips, not sort of big mechanical things. Um, uh, there was, uh, you know, GPS was was one of them. Uh, you know, radios, um, ARM processors, better battery management. They were all those were all things that made it possible to have a drone that was cheap and small. The breakthrough technologies for 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 robocars are um, are, are these. Um, you know, uh, I'll show you in a minute. A minute but the uh, the sensors out there are just getting so good. Uh, not just the cameras that we were talking about, but Things like depth sensing, the Intel RealSense um, series, visual odometry, 
Um, you know, you see, um, you know, obviously LiDAR is getting incredibly cheap. Um, the CPUs are so powerful. Um, you know, not only is the, you know, the Jesse Mano and Raspberry Pi 4, you know, super powerful under $100, but now, you know, NVIDIA is going to be launching their, their Xavier um, in the same form factor. And that's, that's 10 times faster than a, than a TX2. Um, and it's probably going to, it's going to cost like, you know, less than $400. Um, so we're really getting great, um, you know, great tools available to us at this, this price point. Um, obviously, the fact that, you know, that, that, that the Raspberry Pi exists and we can have, you know, single board computers for less than $50 is extraordinary. So that means they can all run Linux. We have enough compute power to be able to, you know, to, to run, you know, Python and deep learning frameworks um, without any issues whatsoever. Um, and then I mentioned before the, the, uh, you know, the notion of a camera and an integrated computer vision processing, you know, chip and code into one. And there's a whole bunch of them right now. Um, we, you know, we, uh, OpenMV, Javoi, Pixie 2. Um, there's one, one just out now called Husky. And this is basically a little board um, which has, you know, a USB port, a camera, and it's all that complicated stuff like, like uh, you know, object recognition and line following and, you know, deep learning frameworks is just built in. They just kind of work right out, you know, right out of the box and can talk to something like an Arduino to drive your car. So that's been really great. And then on the software side, it's just, you know, it goes without saying that that you know the deep learning you know frameworks that are open source like TensorFlow, Keras, PyTorch, etc., have been a game changer. Um, the fact that that the that the simulators um, Unity and Unreal are photorealistic and, and also really easy to work with is also a game changer. And then we're starting to see you know sophisticated uh, robot robotic frameworks um, you know to extend this to um, you know to to more sensors and more sophisticated path following. Nvidia Isaac is one. Obviously ROS ROS two. Are, are one as, as are, are, are there as well. And these things just weren't possible. Everything we're doing right now, you know, um, you know with kids, um, you know, at circuit launch, you know, with an open community for free is stuff that would have been a PhD five years ago. Um, you know, this is stuff that it was, you know, just the domain of the most experienced robotics experts. And now we're, we're, we're you know, right, right now in our, at our, um, at our uh, virtual race this last weekend, um, of the of the top five competitors, two of them were under 16. Of the top five, one with, one of them was 13, and you know, and his 10 year old sister came in like 12th. Um, so this is just you know, just imagine what you know what they would be doing if they if they had to you know had they need a million dollar car or or, or supercomputer to do a you know to do uh you know to do deep learning it'd be like like we were when we were kids out there probably on bikes and having a good time but they wouldn't be they wouldn't be as sophisticated about tech as they are now and this is just like the golden age of democratizing deep learning um so the last thing i wanted to show you was just a glimpse of um of, of what our races look like this was um this is the race this last weekend as i mentioned now that we're um now that we're doing um you know we can't do it in, in person because of the epidemic um we, you know you're starting to see it's head to head now this is what you're seeing here is that all of these are are, are running on a on a server. Um, yeah, so all these are running on a server somewhere. So the simulator is running a server. The cars themselves are running on people's clients, and um, these are racing head to head. And um, that's probably about the speed that they're going. You see, one of them goes off the track. That happens. Going on the outside is not a problem, but uh, inside, if you cut the corners, that is a problem. It's disqualified. You can see you see your you see your score you see your lap time um, you can see the overall the overall place um, and uh, th there's the final one in this case you can see the the best lap this in this case was 18 seconds um, so that is um, you know that is just what we're what we we're, where we are right now we're going to continue doing virtual races the nice thing about the virtual races of course that they, is that they attract like this conference itself attract people from all over the place so for this virtual race. We had a bit, lots of teams from Japan. We had teams from Korea, teams from Taiwan, uh, a bunch of teams from France, teams from Germany, teams from Canada. Um, and uh, you know, in, in, we're probably going to do these every month because they're easier to run than the, than the physical ones. So we're probably going to do you know, two, two virtuals and then one reel and then two virtuals and one reel, even after the quarantine is over because it works so well and it's so inclusive. Um, so with that, that is, um, that is, that is, that is.
pretty much my point. You probably heard that there's you know professionals who are doing this as well. Robo race. This is what it looks like. Um, that's a million dollar car. They uh, they they actually put a human in it for most of the wheel to wheel racing because they don't want to crash it. Um, you know that is that's sort of example example of what we're not doing. Um, we feel that 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 kind of expensive sort of Formula One style of racing is um, is is exclusive. It's it's limited to those who can afford it. They tend to be quite conservative. They worry about risk. They worry about crashing and all that kind of stuff. By making ours cheap and easy and accessible to all, um, you can experiment more. You can have fun. More people can do it. Um, we can actually do more aggressive racing than uh, than we would in you know with these kind of cars. And so. Here you can have a, a link of more more information, but you know it, the final point I'd make is, you know, what are we doing here that's really advancing the you know the the, the state of the art? Um, you know, our cars aren't better than than um, you know than the, than the Google cars or the or the um, you know, the Uber cars or or Zoops or any of the others. So so what are we doing? And the answer is we're innovating in a different way. Um, as you know that. The automotive industry, you know, for a hundred years, innovated through racing. That's where you know new engines, suspensions, aerodynamics, and all were developed um, in real racing. But with self-driven cars, that's not happening because it's too risky. Um, the companies don't want the PR nightmare. Um, they're, they're too expensive. Um, and so, that, and so for the first time really in car history, um, car innovation is not happening in a race context. Context. We want to bring that back. Now, you know, are our cars, you know, going to um, going to teach you know the Googles of the world anything about AI? No. But you know, we are going to solve some problems differently than they would have. So for example, take safety. Um, you know, we try not to hit other cars by being nimble. We're very aggressive, you know, in our in our driving, you know, and, and if if we fail, you know, no big deal. You know, the cars are are, are robust and nobody gets hurt. Um, so we're experimenting with you know, different tactics for navigation that are all about aggression and say and, and, and nimbleness and going fast, et cetera. And it may be that you know these do in actually pr produce techniques that could make cars safer, that could be useful for the overall development of um, self-driving car uh, technology, but never would have been tried um, by the big guys. So in, in the sense, you know, by being you know, small and cheap and safe, we can take more risk. And by taking more risk, we can innovate around a larger space. And we have more people doing it, you know, to thousands and more than 10,000 people in the community around, or, or, you know, around the world. And so, you know, with many eyes, all bugs are shallow. With many wheels, you know, all problems are, you know, become less difficult. And that is what we're doing. And you are very welcome to, uh, to, to join us. Um, go to any one of these, um, you know, links and uh, you'll see our meetups. You can sign up, you can spectate on Twitch at the beginning, and then you can participate or do or participate right off the, Right off the, uh, the, the, the bat, and um, it's designed to be, uh, first of all, fun, and second of all, educational, and, you know, put priority on fun, and, um, you know, I want more people to do self-driving cars, so that more people are doing deep learning in the real world, and uh, that is, um, that is our, our mission, and uh, so far, we're having a blast doing it. So with that, I will stop presenting.